about what is DAM, Digital Asset Management. And how many here are uh, relatively new to Digital Asset Management? Very good. Anybody currently working with Digital Asset Management? Okay. Excellent. So, why don't we, uh, why don't we get into it? We have a panel with us today. We have Peter Parker, Solutions Engineer from Picture Park. Next is Ronald Gill, Digital Asset Management at Condescent. And Beth Fanslow, the Digital Asset Coordinator at Shaw Onsite Canvas Super. Thanks for coming, guys. Really appreciate that. Uh, before I forget, on your way out, if you haven't already grabbed one, uh, Peter and David Diamond were very nice to uh, send us uh, some Dan, the survival guide. Uh, so please pick up your complimentary book before you leave. So we have a, uh, a vendor, which is Peter. We have a consultant and a practitioner. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what the difference is in those three categories. Peter? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'm currently uh, working with a software vendor named Picture Park, uh, and they provide a digital asset management solution. Um, <clears throat> they offer two flavors, either in the cloud as a service, um, or the opportunity to basically implement your own local cloud uh, in your uh, own infrastructure and own it yourself. Uh, so the role I take in that is working with prospective clients, uh, answering questions, uh, helping them to really narrow down what their needs are, what types of resources they need to bring into play to launch a successful program, uh, and then if they choose to go with our software, really sitting in, <clears throat> down with them and doing that deep, deep dive uh, to try and actually learn their processes better than any one individual uh, within their organization knows it themselves. Because uh, so often, you know, in today's world, you find everything is so siloed or compartmentalized um, that everyone you know doesn't know what the other hand is doing as they move things around and that's one of the big uh, advantages of something like a digital asset um, <clears throat> management solution it centralizes all of that content it um, brings people together to share resources talents uh, as well as vision and, and helps to standardize that so i'll sit there and work with all of those disparate groups find out where things overlap, where they need um, unique um, things to account for their specific processes, and try and build out uh, the most optimal solution for them uh, with the least amount of trade-offs so that you create something that will work with everyone, is practical, and can still stand on its own two feet. Um, so you know, that's something I find really interesting, and I bring you know, my years of doing that uh, to the table along with being on the other side of the fence. So I probably sat uh, and you're saying chairs uh, many times when I was first learning it way back when or when we were even trying to figure out what this stuff we were talking about was called uh, it went through a million different names but it sort of finally uh, settled on uh, digital asset management and there are a couple different sort of flavors of similar uh, concepts that we'll touch on later on um, but that's that's <clears throat> where, where I come from I'm Ron Gill. I am a digital asset manager at Cognizant, and uh, my role is very similar to Peter's in the sense that um, I take a look at the uh, platforms that are available out there and try and merge it into uh, company usage. I've done that for a number of other clients, uh, Mercedes-Benz and uh, Warner Brothers. Uh, my solution is I take a look at the vendor landscape, look what's out there, see what needs uh, the client has, and try and plug and play from what the client needs 
to what is out there, to what they need. Um, currently, my role is for Cognizant, which has its own uh, product called AssetServe, and I am implementing the uh, global marketing product line uh, for AssetServe for the entire company. So there's different variables that come into that, which are you know uh, rights management, rights usage across international borders, uh, back and forth um, silos from different companies in different different offices in different countries. So there's a there's a big uh, need for digital asset management across the globe to be able to synchronize and harmonize files for usage and workflow. Uh, so that's pretty much where, where I stand. That leaves me. <laughs> Deb Fanslow. Um, I, along with Frank, am one of the organizers for Jersey Dam Meetup. And when we came up with this topic, I said, wait a minute, I have to be a panelist. No way. Because um, I've had three careers so far. <laughs> Um, started out in music and um, decided to go into art instead because I figured I might make it rich in art instead. So um, yeah, that didn't work. And I became a graphic designer. So along with a lot of people who moved into digital asset management from the creative world, I was first a user of a dance system and then I left the field and earned my library degree. And I have to say, one of my former teachers is here today. When I got my library degree, I first went into the school library path. And I would have to say that being a school librarian was actually one of the closest um, roles to what I do right now, actually. Um, because connecting information and people, it, it really doesn't matter where you're doing it. Um, the type of content, it changes a little obviously if you're going from analog to digital, but the essence is that you're connecting people with information. And um, I learned those skills in a traditional library program and decided to really focus then on learning um, the digital part of it, going back and, and focusing on digital content because obviously it was exploring. And I found that I had that technical fluency that um, really loved structuring information and getting into that um, piece of it. So from where I'm coming from, I, I've, I've kind of started out in the roots of the field before it had a name and moved over to the other side. So I've been on the user side, I've been on the um, administrator side, and so I can speak creative, I can speak librarian, and uh, getting to speak tech a little bit. Um, can I make three corners? I don't know. I'll stick with two. Um, so I've worked in the um, the education industry, publishing, museums, and libraries, and now um, consumer product goods, consumer packaged goods. Good. Okay. Uh, there's quite a few of us here that uh, are very new to Dan. <clears throat> I looked up a uh, definition. Digital asset management systems represents an intertwined structure incorporating both software and hardware and or other services in order to manage, store, ingest, organize, and retrieve digital assets. Um, what would just, uh, uh, taking Deb's leave, what would just uh, take, talk a little bit about how, how we got involved with digital asset management. Um, uh, our company was involved, uh, again, similar to Deb, before digital asset management was actually coined. We did it out of a necessity to organize our assets. And at the time, we were doing a lot of uh, supermarkets and retail, and we had the same images coming in week after week. And we would scan them, we would store them, and uh, after an amount of time, we said you know, there had to be an easier way. And uh, we worked with uh, something called Portfolio, and uh, configured it to uh, meet our needs, and thus was the start of uh, what we were uh, doing with asset management, and that was storing an image, and being able to retrieve it week after week and not have to scan it, do the color corrections, do the masking, and things like that. And that's how uh, I got uh, involved in that over, 10, over 20 years ago. How about yourself, Peter? Uh, well, I started out, I guess, more in the, uh, well, I majored in European history in college, so <clears throat> that probably explains a lot. It uh, <laughs> brings it all together. <laughs> right, but I, I've always enjoyed uh, playing with tech and things like that. I had uh, computers that used to have cassette players in them, 
and calculator keyboards. I think it was a Commodore pen. And then <clears throat> just moved on from there. But the, uh, the first real role where digital asset management became critical, I was at Newsweek for about 10 years. So in the uh, early 90s, we were starting to look at our photographic archives and library, which were all in filing cabinets. So there were negatives, there were prints, uh, there were slides, 35 millimeters, you name it. And we were just then starting to uh, take advantage of uh, CDs for storing of digital files. But of course, that still goes in a case and goes on a bookshelf. Um, and perhaps you had an Excel spreadsheet or something that documented some of that. And we were just watching, you know, 50 years of, you know, things start to fade away um, as the people that had originally curated it, you know, left or retired um, and new people came in. So we were like, wanted to really address trying to get a handle on that while we still had the resources to associate the information uh, with the original content. So um, I started reviewing all the technology in the market uh, then, brought in a number of different consultants to work with us, uh, ended up picking one, um, and they brought in a, a product for us, and we sat down uh, with all the related departments. So that was photography, that was editorial, um, and even to some degree <coughs> our page layout people um, because they were going to, not so much, um, I mean, we did end up adding page design into the systems later on, but it was originally they were the ones that just needed to pull content out uh, to build that. So we looked at what everyone was sort of doing um, and how could we leverage our archives, and we figured we would get a thousand interns in or something like that, have them just start scanning stuff. Um, and that just never happened. So what we ended up doing was we recognized what we had gotten ourselves into and said, well, let's just not get any deeper. So we <laughs> built a system to archive what we worked with that week. Because what we were currently doing is we had a file server with a folder for each department in there, and we would download our images from AP, or the photographer would come in and drop off their <clears throat> film at our lab, and we'd develop it, you know, scan it, get it in, and do all of that. And then they put it into these folders on the server, had an Excel spreadsheet and only one person could check it out at a time and they would grab the next incremental number to put it after that file so that you would then know you know what file was associated with it just meant that every week you had 200.jpg show up with a completely different content and one week it was nation the next one it was entertainment the next week it was under that so we ended up putting in a whole process where instead of things being scanned and given a temporary name and thrown in a folder uh, they would all go into one centralized system. And therefore, designers weren't modifying it on their desktop and keeping their own local copies. And you didn't know which one was actually supposed to go to press. Uh, we had an infamous case of that with, um, there was a family that had, I think, sex tuplets, something like that, and she had horrible teeth. So we had had our retoucher very carefully overemphasize the shadow. So you just didn't know whether her teeth were good or bad. And that was what we wanted to put on the cover. Well, our uh, publishing company saw, or somehow that file got lost, and they're like, oh my goodness, we need to recreate all the work they did. So they went in and gave her perfect teeth. Um, and then that's what ended up, you know, I don't know how many newsstand copies, I think it was about 300,000 back then, and then we had about a 3 million subscriber base. Big story. There were some other instances of that, but I won't bring those up. Uh, so we started to go ahead and build a system to do all that. And part of it was the software. You would put it in, you could now create a department, tag it for that, and therefore you would have like a department structure that you could navigate within the system. But we were also pulling in all of the embedded information from uh, <clears throat> Reuters and AFP and AP and everything like that, the descriptions and the headlines and the titles and the dates and things like that. And that now all became completely searchable. So all of our photo researchers Instead of constantly going to the Reuters site, we just hooked the whole feed directly up into that system, gave everything like a two-week expiration you know, date, um, and if we didn't use it, then it would clear it out to make room for the next stuff. But anything that we did use um, got tagged and filed into our permanent archive, and it also began to build a history of all of our content. And it wasn't long before we recognized the advantages that you could go pull all of the images for the September 26 issue for 1998 without having to do anything other than type in a few keywords and maybe you know apply a filter or something like that. 
and this was like unheard of. I think the original goal was to reduce cost, you know, to keep things easier so you weren't chasing folders. It actually ended up increasing costs, but the number of images that the, the uh, editorial people were working with every week went from about two to 400 to about 4,000. And if you look at the number of awards uh, that the magazine received at that period of time for their covers, for their double, you know, two-page spread stories and things like that, it shot through the roof just because they had that much more um, to, to play with, to come up with more creative choices and everything like that. So sometimes it doesn't always play out the way you expected it to, um, but it definitely gives you a tremendous benefits um, and will give you advantages you probably didn't even expect. So the idea is it's an asset. That means it has value to you. And at least we figured that out early enough and we came up with a way to, to maximize the return uh, we had on all of our assets. And then from there, I just sort of took that whole concept or that whole approach um, you know, to any other different vendors and, or companies I worked with. I was with RR Donnelly for a number of years, so we put in whole solutions for like Toys R Us, uh, for Ralph Lauren, all of their online photography, how to turn an actual uh, photography studio, cranking out 10,000 images a day into an entire <coughs> approval uh, and delivery process that routed everything offshore for color correction and was back the next morning uh, for final high-end retouching and then delivery, automated delivery right into a you know, website. I mean, you need a system uh, that's going to manage that. And if you don't stop and think ahead of time how to build all of that out, um, then you aren't going to be able to, to fully recognize the value of all those assets. So it was that whole foundation in the early... Uh, news magazine you know industry that really just sort of shaped that and let me hear where i am today i'm sorry did you say time magazine news mm -hmm. news, news we don't we don't use that bad <laughs> <laughs> so were you part of the agt group then no no i was actual newsweek staff but um we had an actual agt facility uh, within our building or we, we didn't have the whole building we had uh, multiple oh, floors and they had half a floor you pioneered that photo cd system uh, well, the, uh, the photo sy CD system, it, some of it originated through AGT because they had partnered and leveraged some um, Kodak technology, right. and Scott then Brown's I guess it was the newspaper, was it the New York Daily News? Daily News, yeah. Daily News, yeah. And they put together a whole system process around that, and th that's what we tried to leverage initially, but it, yeah. because it wasn't the... The same workflow, it, it didn't really work for us. I know. How about yourself, Ron? Oh, uh, well, you, I didn't tell you this, but uh, I started out as a painter. Uh, <laughs> could you tell? Um, I, didn't, I didn't think in a million years that I'd be working in digital asset management when I started. Uh, it wasn't even a term back then. Um, so as most painters do when they get out of school, um, they become graphic designers. So. <laughs> I became a graphic designer and I went through that route, uh, graphic designer, senior graphic designer. And uh, that was fun and interesting and I liked it a lot. Um, but part of my task, and I'm sure you probably had the same task, but, where you had to be in charge of stock imagery for thousands and thousands of images. So I always had the fortune of working for large companies that had thousands and thousands of images and I was the guy that always had to manage all those images somehow. So I'd use programs like uh, Canto Cumulus, Thumbs Plus, I don't know if you remember any of those, uh, to help organize and manage these things. And then as the technology went further and further, more systems became more developed and um, the workflow started entering into the system. And that's basically, I think, my, my biggest thing when I, when I look at a DAM system, it's like, how do you incorporate the workflow into the system? Otherwise, you just have a repository of images. Uh, part of that includes, you know, metadata and all that stuff, but it was um, finding out that I did have a keen interest in it because uh, uh, for some reason I like organizing and managing large databases, and especially from coming from a design end where you see it's a little, it's a little stilted where you can't get your work done and <laughs> you just wish the traffic were better or this was managed better, and it all came down to the assets or the images that needed to be handled and moved around. Um, so as 
the years progress and as my titles and roles change, I always have the, the management responsibility of handling all these large assets. And what do we do with that? So um, as, as it came more and more, I get into larger and larger companies that were specifically geared toward pushing their assets out. I eventually walked into a company that, um, you might have heard of the Warner Brothers, that, that handles comic books. And it was a dream job of mine where I'd be able to look at all Superman, Batman stuff, and... You're sitting next to Peter Parker. I know. <laughs> it's Marvel Comics, so we don't talk about Marvel Comics in the DC world. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, it was really uh, fascinating to be able to get all their licensed materials and help them use it and push out the content how they needed to. And it was, um, it's almost like, I don't know, it, part of consulting in, in the damn world for me always, I feel like I'm Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I always have to look at the company's over structure and see how damn could fit in there and see how they're workflowing and, and what, what processes they need in order for the damn to fit into their world. And how would the damn make their world better? And this was always different from initially when it was just a single repository and it was just like, oh, go find the image somewhere in this database. Uh, it, is, it is becoming and morphing into something, and it has been for like the last eight years now, uh, into something that's really more concrete. But there's still a lot of work left to, to do, and there's different areas, and I was just talking to Deb about that, there's, there's different industries that are still looking for the same answers, but they're trying it in different approaches and not really talking to each other. So hopefully we'll be able to we'll be able to change that at some point and we'll be able to talk amongst that. I know academia has a specific set of tools that they use. I know the real, the legal world has a specific set of tools that they use, and uh, the entertainment world definitely does. So uh, it's exciting to me at this point to see how far BAM has come and where it's going. And I'm lucky enough to be in a company that is kind of pushing that envelope um, to be able to help. Uh, uh, manage workflows across the globe, and that's that's exciting. That's the that's the that's why I'm here. Thanks. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, what DAM is, what it is not. I'll try to zero in a little bit more for uh, people here that are still new to DAM as to what it really involves and how is it uh, benefit everybody that uses it. We can uh, we can sort of start with. Um, a lot of these things can almost be think or thought of as sort of like a tiered step up uh, in terms of capabilities. Um, that originally, you know, I think a lot of us have, have said when we first got started, we ended up with huge collections of assets. And when we say assets, that's really just a synonym for a computer file, whether it's a Microsoft Word document or a JPEG or a TIFF or a PDF or something like that. Uh, and it's going to be in a folder somewhere on your computer or on a server. I think that's the way it's been uh, for year after year. And the idea is as the number of those folders um, became more and more and the number of files that were in there uh, became more and more, it became more and more difficult uh, to find what you want. And there were definitely people that came up with very clever ways to manage that. Uh, I remember some people that built out a whole system uh, on their Mac server that supported what they called labeling with colors. So you could right click and different <laughs> labels would mean different things. So you would have this whole rainbow uh, of folders and that would tell you something instantly besides just the name of the folder, uh, or what it was for, what, what purpose it had. And they did some really neat things you know, with that. Uh, but again, that was really more file management. You know? And that was the very first sort of step towards a digital asset management is, okay, what are some smart ways to look at managing all of these files? And I think we've seen another step up on that uh, in a lot of tools out there, things like Google Drive, uh, Dropbox, things like that. Those are still primarily based on building hierarchy or folders with some neat tricks. Uh, sometimes they do offer like a thumbnail preview or something like that, so you don't have to actually download uh, or completely open the file. A lot of computer operating systems do that right now. You can just right click on something and say preview. You don't have to fully open the file or hit the space bar on something. Uh, so there are a lot of these things that have sort of uh, moved along the evolution of what we would call file management. Uh, but digital asset management would be like the next tier above that where you're also tying in information about the assets. And again, we're still talking about assets and files, but now we're combining it with information. 
Um, but let's not confuse that with just keywords. That's really more just keywording. I mean, yes, you can put an asset into a system and you can put a string of keywords there. But if you have blue, you know, yes, if you search for blue, you might find that asset, but that's not really telling you what is blue. You know, is it that the content in the thing is blue? Is it the photographer's name was blue? You just really come up with a keyword or a tag. So the idea is um, that then evolved into a much more structured or granular uh, data break based approach to things. Uh, and that was really the birth of digital asset management. Uh, there are some other branches or variations and you may be able to speak to, uh, to some of those a little bit more. Uh, and then that sort of has spilled off into what we've called more content management. And if you really think about it, content, yes, it includes um, assets, but it's oftentimes what is in a document or what is in a web page. And those systems are really more geared towards the final conclusion of that content and really aren't structured around the individual pieces. A lot of publishing systems fall into that where you can create headlines and paragraph ones uh, and picture one and picture two and that's great. You have it all structured on a single page and you can reuse that or lasso it and add it somewhere else and save that grouping or something like that. But that's really geared towards managing the content within that structure whether it's a page or a website uh, or something like that. And a lot of times those systems will actually leverage a dam behind it um, in order to help better manage the individual uh, pieces of content like that. So um, things, let's say, like Sitecore or uh, other web um, page management tools would not really be considered digital asset management. That would more be like website management, content management. Uh, the same thing for a lot of publishing systems. I don't know if anyone uh, remembers QPS from way back when. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, Adobe has its own solution now with NCopy and everything like that. Uh, those are really more uh, copy management. So a lot of times when you're really looking at what is digital asset management compared to a lot of these other functionalities, whether it's very basic file management or if it's really geared towards managing the individual pieces within a larger object, uh, DAM is that sort of piece in the middle. And I, I think you have a bit more experience with some of those different branches, so maybe you can kind of clarify yeah. where that fits in. Can I just ask a question before you move on? How do you get from a file to an asset? So you said, so the basic foundation there is a file, and then the next step is an app, or the, the next direction in the management of these files is it becomes an asset. Somehow. I would call them synonyms. Really, when okay. it's an asset, it just means that you have now accounted for it. So if you want to think of people, right? They're just people until they come into your school and then they become a student because you now have accounted for them and you've assigned them to a teacher in a classroom and, and right. given them a schedule. So, so it's an asset once you define its value. A file becomes an asset when you define its value. Or yeah. you, when you define its value and you Properties. add it to the Properties. system where you are now accounting for it. I'd actually like to expand. And, yeah, well, she, she probably has some great, great pieces okay, for the difference. So, so I've heard um, a couple <coughs> of different stories. And first, we're talking about classification here when you're talking about DAM versus enterprise content management versus document management, records management, uh, everyone else's little siloed solutions to managing information. Um, so uh, the way that, I, that I've heard it that I really like is that a file becomes an asset when it has metadata that describes the asset for discoverability and when you have the rights to use it because it is absolutely completely without value if you do not have the rights to use it and the only way you're going to know currently is by having that rights information either embedded in the file or the database i do both so you can go around with semantics forever um, if you look at in in the industry one of the older journals was the Journal of Digital uh, Asset Management. Now it's the Journal of Digital Media Management. When I'm talking to people who are not in the field, I say digital media management, because people know what media is. And first, you're going to think of files and storage, IT, all that good stuff. Um, bringing metadata into the conversation and actually talking about the value of your assets and how they increase as you continue adding metadata to them, people start to understand, oh, Okay, because people don't really understand when you're looking at a database, you're looking at a preview image that's stored on some server somewhere. That's not your file at all. And even in Google, you're not searching 
the entire internet, you're searching an index of the internet. So it's, it's these abstractions that we don't normally see. And when you start to teach people that the, the file has to live with that metadata, that's when it becomes valuable and you can use it. If you can't find it, you might as well not have it. Once you do find it, if you don't have those rights, so, so that's one way I've heard it described that I kind of latch on to. But everyone, I mean, the industry is so young that everyone has their own take on it. And quite frankly, in 10 years, we might have talked about something else. So, yeah. No, no, those are very good points. And I think the one thing that was saying, yes, it's a file, but think of it as an asset once you add it to your system. Once you add it to your system, by definition, you have started to associate metadata with it, but then the other piece, you have now also created the beginning of its history. And that is another critical component of that. Um, there are files on your server, you have no idea where they came from, where they're going, what have been, what's been done with them. Uh, another core principle of, of digital asset management is that it also now provides a diary to manage and record the history of that file since it has belonged to the system. So that is going to uh, you know, require things like rights to know when and where uh, it can be used. It's going to require all of that different metadata um, in order for people to be able to categorize it or find it. Um, and then there's going to also be a whole other layer uh, in terms of like distribution and retrieving it out of the system. Uh, but I think we'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, and that's going to be doing things like creating the previews or thumbnails or uh, <clears throat> conversion of the file and things like that. But um, the real, real thing, the difference between like a file and an asset would be that you are now associating different layers to it um, and you are now giving um, it a beginning to its history. Yeah. I, I agree completely. It's a, when the file gets into the system and becomes part of the entire uh, DAM system, and it actually has its first steps into the, the workflow of the, uh, the company or the members using the, the system. So it might I'd like to just add like, you know, for me, it's, it's an asset is part of the work stream. So once it gets in there, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, an integral part of it, but once it's got the metadata, once it's ingested into the system, then it becomes useful. Uh, so an asset is more useful than a single file. So yeah, that's, that's where, very good. Why don't we talk about uh, some of the issues or some of the uh, what's the problems that are solved? Oh, I can I can get that first one. We're, we're you that like that one? one? Yeah, I like that one. All right, <laughs> uh, we'll go with branding. So right, right now, um, a lot of large companies have the, their biggest problem is uh, keeping their brand from being diluted. Um, and dilution of brand happens when you have a large company that's got you know five or six or you know 20, 30 offices worldwide, and they're all using the same asset, but it needs to either be geared towards that regional market, or it needs to change slightly in its verbiage or its right usage. So, in that aspect, trying to keep your brand uh, clear and identifiable across those markets is a tricky thing to do, and Dam really does solve that problem because it keeps everything at the single point of truth, right? Or uh, the single source of truth, which is inside your company's dam. And uh, everything can be uh, pushed out from that center point, as opposed to resting in somebody's silo, in somebody's hard drive somewhere, or uh, God knows what can happen to it, like lights could change, things could move around, that image can't be used now, or the messaging has changed. This will give you a, a better um, output of delivering your message across many different channels, and, but keep the brand consistent. Um, it's difficult to do that if you have uh, companies that are using uh, their own specific types of systems across different offices. So that's the that's a little bit of brand management that definitely solved it's solved by uh, yeah. I will, I will add a caveat there. Uh, okay. <laughs> the devil's advocate. Yeah. I will say um, the dam should be the single source of truth, as everyone likes to say. Um, if it's configured properly, if you have the policies around it, um, the people, the process, the information, it all works together. Um, so just tease me a little bit. <laughs> but um, I, I've seen absolutely, um, when you're configuring a system, and you, you have to be really careful with versioning and how you are keeping track of 
of the process where assets are ingested into the system and do you have check in and check out? I mean, how are people working with that file concurrently? So it's, it's not just that it lives up there, it's you have to have that policy around um, the people who are working with those assets to really understand um, what they're doing when they move a file, if they copy a file, if they version it, what happens to that single source of truth. Do we need to lock it down to certain groups? And it really becomes complex, um, a complex puzzle when you're dealing with, especially with full brands. And um, so it's, it's a lot more tricky than you would think. And of course, the, the logos and style guides are an organization's most valuable assets by far. So um, that consistency that you're talking about is, I mean, that's the prime example right there, so. Yeah, I think and it will kind of tie together a few of these things or apply to a few of these things. Uh, I like your single source uh, description. I've always just used a central repository. The idea is that rather than there being multiple copies of something out there that may or may not be at some level of sync, um, the idea is you come up with corporate policies. That this is a single central repository, uh, and when you need to use some particular file or asset, you pull it from that central repository because the copy there is managed. If it's been updated, you'll get the copy with all of those updates reflected in it. If they change your logo from teal to a neon blue, when you go and pull out corporate logo, you're going to get the one with the new corporate um, you know, standards applied to it. And even though you may have a copy you pulled out last week on your desktop, if you're still not going back to that single source of truth or that managed central repository, you don't know if you are uh, applying all of those standards. Now, that being said, I have yet to find a creative group that does anything other than take the path of least resistance. Um, so if they can bypass any extra step that helps uh, keep things going, uh, they're probably going to do it unless you've really got buy-in from the overall environment. So that means that uh, <clears throat> managers and everything are, are going to need to call people out when they do that, saying, what if we had changed from teal to neon blue? And you, I can see right there when I look at your links palette, the path to it shows it's on your desktop. You need to use the copy out of the system. You know, no if, ands, or buts. Yes, I know. It seems a little bit more work, but it's doing that that makes the whole system work. Um, so that was kind of my other point. It will give you a tool to help you manage um, logo and brand management, but by itself, it's not going to do anything. It's going to require the policies that you guys are talking about. It's going to require the workflows that will uh, allow people to feel like it isn't too much work to push it through these things. And then there's got to be an SOP that this is just how you do things. And then you're going to use the dam as the tool to facilitate those workflows and procedures um, and that's going to do uh, so much for you know all the rest of that you talk about versioning and management um, <clears throat> controlled vocabularies you'll have tools there but if people don't use it then it's not controlled at all or yeah, it's not versioned yes um, I actually so you were giving the example before with the picture where the teeth got photoshopped and then they there was the original, the teeth got photoshopped correctly, the teeth got photoshopped a different way, so you've got the three different versions. With the modern digital asset management system, how do you deal with that? Do you actually end up hiding the original so that the marketing team only has one cover image to go grab from that folder? Yes. Do you do you re are you just changing the name? Like this is the use this version name? Like how do you deal with that particular issue of the edited photos versus the originals? Each, each system has the possibility to deal with that differently. Um, some of them, and, and definitely rights to what you can access in the system is going to be a huge part of, of any good digital asset management system. I think normally that should be, if not number one, the number two list on what needs to be you know, a critical strength yeah. uh, of any solution you pick, and that's the ability uh, to control access. So if you are working with something like a, a retouched image, okay, you're probably only going to want people that are in the pre-approval group to have access to new unretouched photography. So when someone logs into a system, if you belong to the photography retouching group, then yes, you should be able to see uh, new photography. And you should probably be able to check it out, make changes to it, and then upload it as a new version. 
Now, this is where things like rights come into play. It's still only going to be your group that would have access to that along with some, let's call it, approver group. Maybe this isn't a retoucher, but this is some editorial person that is going to be the one that signs off when they're happy with the corrections or changes that have been made. Uh, once they execute that approval, that can expose that asset uh, to a wider group. Now, it can still have all of its previous incarnations beneath it, but those can be restricted to the groups that are supposed to have access to it. And therefore, it can then be exposed, and you can also break that at you know, even more granular. It's like, okay, I've approved it, but I've only approved it for the North American group. So people that log in that belong to the North American group will see the final retouch version, but the people in Europe will not see it because they haven't been approved to use it within their market. Um, so got, that goes back to a lot of those workflows uh, that Gil was talking about and all of those procedures. I mean, there are tools that you can create restrictions on, that you can create a, an approval process, uh, that you can build versions you know, where they stack like cards or that they sit side by side. Each solution is going to have a slightly different way of handling that. And it's going to be up to you to look at the environment it's going to be used in and to find what your needs are. Do you only want these people to have access to only this and not that? You've got to build all of those rules, that whole matrix, and then take advantage of how your software works. Um, in order to implement that. So there is no solution. This is how it's done in DAM. It's going to be DAM will give you tools to come up with how you want to manage that. And hopefully you'll be able to do it in, in the most efficient way with the tools you pick. Yeah, and then speaking to that, the, the tools that are, are being offered are from the vendor landscape and they're all very different. Uh, they're not really uh, the same across the board. Some systems will allow you to overwrite the file that you have. Some people, some systems will uh, keep track of the versions that you post up, and it all depends on which, which model and, and which tools and how you want to implement that into your system. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a question of like how would you specifically do it, it's how do you want to do it. And based on the tools that are out there, how you can use that. Do you want to speak a little bit on the uh, subway map from uh, Royal Story? Yeah, actually that. I want to go back and just talk about one thing. Absolutely. Because that's also been on my mind lately. Uh, so right now we're currently developing a controlled vocabulary. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that term, controlled vocabulary. Uh, it's very important um, in, in part of the to uh, be able to put your um, commonly used terms together, uh, and even not so commonly used terms, especially if you're using meta, ta meta tagging. Um, so for example, if I needed a, a car that was red and I need some metadata on it, um, I could say red, someone else might say rouge, someone else might say uh, maroon. Um, so keeping that lexicon together inside the controlled vocabulary will allow you to all speak the same language. And obviously car and red is very vague terms and that would only apply to like a photo. Uh, but if you're in a company that uses specific language for products or services that they sell or use, that lexicon should be part of the controlled vocabulary so that it can easily be meta uh, tagged to that appropriate asset. So that's part of the control vocabulary system that uh, currently in development. And it usually takes uh, some hand-holding and, in my experience, uh, close working with the subject matter experts in that specific area of the taxonomy that you're working towards uh, in order to create a, a thorough and proper usable uh, control vocabulary. And it is of vast importance that, uh, that is set up right away in the beginning. Uh, it's, uh, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I'll come in on this one. <laughs> yeah, no, Dev could probably comment far too much on that. But I was going to say, your taxonomy should precede your software. Yeah. The point being that your foundational taxonomy or hierarchy is a huge construct that is built over years. So you've got your, your brands and products, you've got your, your um, descriptive kind of information that would be used to describe your assets. You've got countries, you've got divisions, and they all, you know, are associated with your organization. And from where I'm coming from, you take pieces of those that branches and you put them into your damn system in certain places. And when you use your taxonomy in your folder structure, it's usually behind the scenes to organize where your assets live on a server somewhere. 
Now, when you use your taxonomy terms, in the metadata fields themselves, they're usually called controlled vocabularies. In the library world, we see taxonomy as an example or a type of controlled vocabulary. But for some reason, when they're in little drop downs, the word controlled vocabulary is just kind of took over. So if that makes sense at all, <laughs> um, ideally the best practice from uh, where I'm coming from is to have that structure in place and then make sure your system can support the relationships that you need between your assets and how you want to find them. And then ultimately you want to um, take that taxonomy and push it out through the enterprise so all your systems speak the same language. Yes? So <clears throat> now we have systems where Google's image recognition software you don't have to tell it. Uh, Google Photos, you can search for photos of beach or cats or dogs. And mm -hmm. the software or the systems are now available that can actually just look at the picture and find out what it is. Now, would, would we still need taxonomy and hierarchies to describe that picture or image or media? I can, I can answer. You're talking about Google Vision API, right? Uh, that's in its nascent stage right now. It's not. It's not 100%. And the metadata that it pulls is still very. It's I think 80% accurate, and it's at, the, at a very low level. So if you have something that's specifically meant for your company, you still need manual import to get that in there because you need a subject matter expert to look at that and apply apply the appropriate metadata to it. Now, that stuff is, like I said, it's, it's just starting out, and there are a couple of companies. I know Nuxio is using it. I know, uh, I think OpenText said they might be using it. Um, and and it's, still, it's still new. You're still going to need um, the overall hierarchical structure of a taxonomy to be able to put all those things together. You, you still need that, that, that pre thought that needs to be planned out and put together before um, you can task any kind of program to automatically input that data for you. And that still requires an evaluation of the current system and how you're using your workflow. That breaks down into the taxonomy that goes into your system. Um, so I don't know if you've, have you, any of you tried uh, using Google Vision API? They have a test beta out for a little while. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's good, but it's good at a very basic level. So if you're looking for something that's going to accurately reflect your metadata to what your company really needs or what you're looking for to describe your asset, it's not there just yet. Uh, but what Deb was talking well, about... It, it will get there at some point. It will get there. It, it, may, it may get there, but uh, I, there, there's a lot of detail that's specifically... Like if I'm looking at like um, uh, uh, M-Class car and it's got a certain option, uh, I'm not sure that the system will be able to pull that information out, especially if they can't see the badges or whatever, but a system, a subject matter expert would be able to. Uh, but the overarching idea about that is that there's still no program out there that will build your taxonomy for you. That still needs to be investigated and that still needs to be created by uh, a human. Yeah, I mean, we, we've played around, we've got in beta something very similar, and the results are, are quite impressive. I mean, I'll sit there, and I'll take like my old Fiat, you know, commercials, and I'll, you know, upload them and run them against the, what, what we're calling like auto tagging, uh, and it can register that there's a car, and it can register that there's a girl in the picture. Uh, however, um, the fact, and they'll and they'll say model because they're assuming she's a model, but is she or isn't she? Because I mean, it is just a picture of a girl in a bikini sitting on the hood of a car in a 1960s, you know, sort of, you know, setup. Um, there are so many innuendos in that picture. It, it can only take objective tags out of that picture. It can't take any subjective ones, and it can't necessarily apply any context. Um, so certainly some of those tools are coming down the road. They're, they're really neat, um, but at the same time, their lexicon or controlled vocabulary that they draw upon is not necessarily going to be filtered down to your corporate or your organization's one, um, and it's really not going to understand the logic of the relationship between the metadata and the assets that you want to establish. 
So it, it, it definitely has the potential to become a very useful tool, but really more in just collecting, I would say, objective descriptive data out of it. Yeah, I agree. I think, just real quick, um, how long does it take to audit that metadata versus enter it yourself at that point? Um, I've seen demos where the, those keywords just get thrown into a keyword field and it's all garbage in, garbage out. There's some good nuggets in there, but who's going to sit there and review all of that versus take 30 seconds to put it in yourself? That's just where we're at right now. I can't obviously speak to where we'll be 10 years from now. Sure. So. And just to give a <clears throat> sort of a plug for our own David Diamond, uh, who authored the, the book, and I hope you guys will all grab a copy of uh, the uh, Dam Survival Guide. Uh, we showed him the implementation of our thing, and it was great. It had about an 80% you know, success rate, but then there was definitely 10. Like, I don't know where it came <laughs> up with that from. And so we had to build in the idea that it was providing suggested keywords. And then you had a list there, and therefore someone was responsible for checking which ones you wanted to keep and which ones you did not want to come back if that image got re-entered or color corrected and put back into the system and reanalyzed. So you actually had to maintain three lists. Here's what it said, here's what you liked, and here's what it don't like, and don't show that to me again. You know. So the audit process is... Yeah as you know is as significant as the benefits that this neat auto tagging type of capability brings and David was like wow that's really cool but I don't see it as a valuable product yet not yet see how it goes well, there's uh, there's an example <coughs> I just want to touch on this uh, from a uh, uh, recent uh, article from the sports video group where they were tracking uh, I think it was Philadelphia Eagles games and they were looking at uh, video footage and they were trying to get the system to pull out metadata from you know, image stills or just from the video playback itself. And they could get football field, they can get players, they can even get the names off the numbers. But if a football player is talking to a specific coach and they're not looking at the camera, the facial recognition isn't there, it's on its way. But the, the best data that you can enter right now has to still be audited by human. Or an alien, but yeah. <laughs> so, we did pull a slide from a real story of the uh, comparing different systems that are available out there today. Uh, real story takes an objective view, just reports the uh, actual data and what these systems can actually do. Did we want to spend a little time talking on them, or is that a... They're kind of what they call themselves the consumer reports of um, this kind of software. And they put out the map every year, and it's kind of interesting if, if you like to research like I do to um, take those maps and see how the industry has changed, who comes and who goes, and who consolidates, and as the industry um, matures, uh, you get a picture of, of where the innovation is happening, and who's trying to do it all, and who's trying to do um, just damn, and, and it's really, uh, that's what I like about the way that they laid it out. Again, it's a classification. It's about 10% of right. the market. Yeah, so these categories, that's their um, particular classification. And somebody else might have another. So um, this is typically how it is talked about in the industry, though, which is why we chose to uh, borrow from there. Yeah, just want to illustrate uh, so. how, how much, how far we've come and uh, the selection that is out there, depending on your needs, what your company needs will be. I think the one value I found in something like this is, uh, you know, we can talk about what is digital asset management versus what isn't it. Um, and there are certainly specialized tasks that are not necessarily a requirement for something to be a digital asset management. If you want to manage your Twitter feed, right, now certainly a lot of that is just going to be tweets, they're going to be text-based. So those are not really dependent um, on having a physical file or asset behind it. And they're not necessarily going to be something that you would reuse. They have a single life, though you may want to track its history and who retweeted it and something like that. But that's managing a Twitter feed. Uh, there are some damn systems that have some element of that to them, and then there are other systems that do nothing but manage your Twitter feed. And so when you start to think of all these different things that a system could do, and it's sort of like 
do you want something that does your core priorities very well, in which case you need to focus on an individual branch, or do you want something that tries to throw everything into the kitchen yeah. sink and doesn't really do any of them well, or you know, it does some things basically, and yes, today this looks like the flash bang thing, but it's probably gonna work far best in the sales presentation than it does in actual practice. Um, so really, you know, think about that. And that's where this, you know, this is good. It does show you that there are very different branches. And at the very core of it, the type of people that sort of are in the center are usually more related to the back ends of some of those other products. I mean, any digital asset management system is gonna run on a database. You know, and you're probably at this point, when you look at systems, they're gonna be relying on SQL-based ones. So right there, that says Oracle, Microsoft or one of the open source you know, alternatives. Um, so that's where those players get right there in the core because once you build a database, a lot of the core functionality is now available for a DAM. How you end up managing uh, your ACLs or permissions, how you manage uh, your manipulation of those images or establishing relationships between different types of files, that's where those individual vendors are either gonna be very strong or it's going to sort of be included as part of the kitchen sink. Um, so again, I think that just does a good job of demonstrating how people are all over the map, and that's why you need to research it to find out what your understanding of digital asset management is and what are the tasks that you need to accomplish for your organization with your files or, or assets. It was uh, used to illustrate just how much is out there. Be very careful. In that. Evaluating as Peter's talking about what your needs are. And there's plenty, plenty of systems out there to care to just what it is that you're looking for. Um, when we talk, Deb, if you want to talk a little bit about the difference between enterprise and SaaS, SaaS has been more and more uh, becoming more and more available only in the last couple of years. Um, is anybody here, is everybody familiar with the terminology of SaaS? S A A S? Some? Some not? Uh, software as a solution. You want to talk a little bit about uh, differences and the pros and cons? Sure. I'm, I'm actually going to, I can give the foundation, but I'm actually going to toss it over to Peter sure. afterwards because they have more of the, um, the back end um, technical aspect sure. of it. I can give more of the, the front end. Um, basically, I think when we say enterprise here, we're talking about is your system um, owned and, and hosted physically in your company where you're managing the, the infrastructure, the software, the support, everything. You're responsible for everything. So you better have your backups, just saying. Sure. Um, and then on um, software as, we call it software as a service. Uh, we've heard a couple of things. Um, you're, you're basically um, turning over some of that control for um, having that scalability and using other people's servers and um, services on top of that to offload and avoid your IT department. Say that. Um, to, uh, to be able to um, only have to deal with certain part of it, whether it's the middleware or the system itself. Um, and you can expand your storage out based on who your service provider is. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, so essentially, it, a, the industry used to be a lot of um, internal hosting, and it's moved increasingly over to um, SaaS, as we call it. There are some vendors that are only offering a SaaS deployment model right now, and there are some that are hybrid, and they'll offer you, you know, on-site, in the cloud, a little bit of both. Um, so it really depends on um, a lot of factors, what um, security you need, and what your, um, support level is in-house for supporting that technology, and then you can throw in the open source or, or proprietary on top of that, and um, how quickly you need to scale, and a whole host of other factors that I can't possibly uh, compress into you know one minute, but um, I, I think it's really just being aware of where your data lives, who's managing it, um, beyond just here's the interface looks great. Um, there's a lot more under the hood to really understand about where your data is, is it backed up, um, who's managing the integrity of it, what are their policies behind it, and what is that total 
cost over five years because there's that that argument of well which is which is going to be cheaper and I don't you know currently I, I don't think there is an answer it's really based on your needs so that's that's kind of where I'm coming from from the practitioner level mm -hmm. so. yeah from the consultant level it's more like uh, if you're looking at uh, software as a service or uh, enterprise solution the biggest uh, thing that I I'd say watch out for is uh, the software as a service can be located in England per se and uh, their time of operation is not going to be the same time as your time of operation so if anything goes wrong with your dam or your solution uh, there's a window that you have to account for all the time. Now, some of them say, do say that they have 24 7 access but that's you know that's all this, you know from the salesman point of view whether they do or not so that's the only good caution that I would say. Obviously, the, uh, the physical implementation is a lot more expensive uh, to actually build something in, uh, on site, on premise. Um, but the solution can be a cheaper alternative, but there is a, that caveat where you have to make sure that uh, you, they, you can get to them when you need them. That's something that can always happen in some industries you're not allowed to store your data in certain countries, so things like that. So there's there's a number of factors. Yeah, most international companies won't let you store won't <coughs> allow their data to be stored in the US actually. <laughs> uh, not, not, not to be too silly, but um, there are reasons why <coughs> most international companies, if they use SAS, will choose something outside of the United States uh, because with all the turmoil we've had, there's actually legislation in place that allows the government to supersede uh, the corporation's control of that of that data, and mm -hmm. other countries protect uh, the data from that. So, yeah. it really depends on your corporation's need. Um, I have slightly different definitions for these, but again, you know, everyone is going to have different definitions for almost everything in this industry uh, at this point. When I think enterprise. Um, I usually think of scale. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever used like iPhoto on a Mac to manage all the pictures you take on your phones and come home and manage that. That's great for a family solution, but I don't think you've ever heard of a company with 500,000 images trying to manage it in iPhoto. But it's free. Well, of course it's free. Um, and then can that new system recognize that structure or do you have the resources to hire a developer to create good guy to do that? <laughs> Um, but I think um, a consumer-based Evernote account is, is different than an enterprise dam system with a contract behind it that would, I've seen ones that, um, you know, have contingencies and things in there. If, if, if the um, company was to go bankrupt, you know, legally, this is what happens to the data. And, it, you know, they're very aware of where that data is, who owns it, where, you know, is it backed up, and, um, I haven't heard any horror stories about people not getting their data back from a vendor, but I will still call it an exit strategy. Gil probably has his own anecdotes, but I've certainly <laughs> yeah, uh, so, done, done so, yeah. plenty of migrations. Someone bought a solution, they had it in their company for 10 years, the, the company may still be around, but not putting the same type of development into it that they want, and they're looking at all of these uh, younger, more aggressive companies that are bringing a lot more to the table in terms of what you can do with their software. Uh, and they're looking at the price point. It's like, oh my God, I've got this old, you know, behemoth, you know, from 10 or 15 years ago. Yes, it was cutting edge, but I'm paying, you know, $125,000 a month for it. And you know what? I can get something that does far more for that price for a year. You know, so let's talk about um, either you cutting my uh, monthly costs, you know, by 90% and offering all of this commitments to development, which rarely happens. Um, and then what does it take to get an export of all of the content you put in and then import it into that other system? Now, there is definitely going to be a cost associated with that. Um, I typically find that that takes between one and six weeks. Um, depending, you know, again, on the volume of content. And then you'll have to recognize that there are going to be relationships between metadata and assets that exist in one system to provide some sort of functionality that will not exist in another system. Um, 
so really what you've got to do is look at what the new system you're moving into, what type of functionalities and relationships and features it offers, and what information you have stored in your old system that can be used to best populate that. And there'll never be a 100% uh, migration of functionality, but the idea is that um, the reason you're migrating is because of the advantages that new system will give you. Why don't we talk a little bit about uh, onboarding, <clears throat> what it takes to set up this initiative, what you need to be conscious of, you're thinking about. Yeah. Well, uh, the best thing that uh, I think we've talked about before, the best thing is to uh, understand the overall company structures and needs and then build your taxonomy based on that. Um, everything else falls in line after that, but looking at where your resources, and this is where I was saying uh, kind of like your Sherlock Holmes and figuring out what the company's uh, overall needs are in terms of what the solution can provide. Uh, so you're looking at what kind of content you have, what, what situations that you've used those contents in, and if there's a workflow involved and if you're going to incorporate the workflow into the system, how would you do that? Um, so the big, the big first step is to take a look at the overall, everything that you have, everything that you need organized and sorted, and then uh, figure out your uh, structure from that point on. Um, look at the vendor landscape, and like I said, there's, uh, there's quite, uh, the build map shows you there's quite a lot of vendors out there, but determining which ones have the best, um, I guess, uh, features that you're looking for, uh, would probably be best in looking at uh, companies like the Real Story Group and other uh, vendors and talking to them and seeing what solutions that are, that are out there that can be provided to you uh, to for your company and, and their needs. Um, I don't know if there's any other. I'm actually just going to say um, David Diamond Guide actually was one of the earliest um, books written about the implementation process, and he's got some real choice nuggets in there about. Um, bringing people on board, which is one of the things we are always thinking about the technology, but how do you bring, you know, get that buy-in, get people to use the system. Yes, it has to be structured so that people can find stuff, but they need to be part of that process of defining your, your terms that you're gonna use. And how do they wanna find information? What facets are we gonna use to search by? Do we need to search by brand? Do we need to search by division? Or is it, is this unit, what do we call it? Um, so once people feel like they have say in it, they're going to be more willing to go along with it. And of course, what's in it for me? Always. So you have to tell people, um, why is this going to make their life better? Yes, there might be some initial um, investment in time and getting to learn the system, but this is why it's going to work for you. And one of the things that, that David did that I really liked was um, he kind of put it in terms of who the audience is that you're talking to. It's going to have different benefits for your um, executives versus your um, subject matter experts versus the marketing department, the sales department. And if you really want to get people on board and understand the benefits, you need to tailor it to what they're getting out of the system. Not everyone's going to use it the same way. So that's the people part of it that, that I tend to focus on. Um, adoption. Throughout, yeah, the adoption system throughout while you're doing it. You really have to have the people and the users in mind even before you get the system, as you're configuring the system, um, bringing those people in early and having those conversations. Because the system should be based on their needs. So the woman who's kind of trying to bring that content to the IT guy so he can provide a software solution, but the, the people who are producing it don't want to share it. But they have to share it, but then they're sort of hiding it there. So it, it, it's, it's weird. It, it's, and I just, there's no resolution to this. Because this is a human problem. Yeah, no, I mean, a, a good thing is to always remember that if you're going to bring in a damn system, organizational buy-in is critical. And there are definitely going to be have, you know, different groups that have different needs and different priorities. And it's got to be like a consolidated decision where people recognize there are going to be trade-offs. There are going to be the you know, metadata maniacs that will be adamant that all of this information needs to be associated to something before you can add it into the system. Because if they do that, there are all these tangible benefits down the road and everything will always work perfectly and everything will be right at your fingertips and it will be like a fantastic symphony. You 
know, without one note out of tune. Um, but then you're going to look at here are all of the people in the audience. Well, they're going to be checking their texts and they're going to be doing this, and they're not concerned about that perfect piece. They're just sort of like, I'll need this, and when I have that, I want to throw it at it, and if it's obvious, I'll click the button. But if you start asking me 20 things to do when I put that in, I'm just going to figure out a way not to do it. You know, and so you've really got to say, okay, if I can just get you to do this one thing, then we'll have this other group do this thing they didn't want to do, but then that means over here you will just be able to click a button. And you've got to use that sort of trade-off. So it is a huge, huge um, piece of diplomacy that needs to occur for any successful implementation. And a perfect example, I had a, uh, a colleague who implemented, um, or rather he, well, yes, he implemented a system at Cabela's. It's a huge outdoor sporting goods uh, company. It has a you know, billion dollar worth of sales uh, every year. And way back when, they decided they needed a digital asset management system. So their IT department went out, researched all the capabilities, brought one in, configured it, looked at all the departments, set up groups and permissions, uh, and put it out. And the creative department wouldn't touch it. <laughs> sat there idle for five years and they did the whole i keep things in my folder on my desktop or in my folder on the <laughs> server five years went by a new art director came in used words i can't repeat in this audience to you know say what is this um and he's like we need to bring in a system to manage that uh and he's like i've got three very you know credible you know ones that i think we should look at and see what fits our organization work I, best i've worked with all three of them um, and someone raised their hand. I think we actually have one of them here. I guess we'll think, why aren't you using it? And so they brought the vendor back in with a consultant and they went through and left basically IT out of it. And all the people that were going to actually use the system sat down and came up with their trade offs. Like, I don't want to have to go in and search and download every time I place an image on a page. And it's like, right, but what if we did this and this so that they were all together? You know, so that all 50 of the images you might use for this are all going to be in like one window and you could drag and drop. And then you don't have to find it on your desktop. It'll be a nice window with thumbnails. And I'm like, well, that wouldn't be so bad. And if you would do that, then it would help this, this, and this. And I can take that other thing that you hate doing and I'll get that group to do it. You know, <laughs> and it was this whole back and forth. And it went from satting, sitting idle with maybe about 400 assets in it for five years to three years later having, I think, 1.6 million you know, assets in it, and the number of files and creation things that went in and out of that system on a daily basis you know, was astronomical. So it's just really different. It's the exact same piece of software. And not saying that the IT department didn't come up with some nice logic, but unless you can really get everybody to participate and feel that whatever it is they're doing that is different from what they did before, is offering benefit and they're getting something in return. I think to stack on to that, it, everyone likes to say, well, it should be your work is for the benefit of the larger organization, but you know, day to day, okay, what's in it for me? You know, I have this deadline, this is what I need to do, and it's either getting in my way or it's helping me. And what do I have to do to learn how to use this tool? Is it worth it? So you have to bring people in and show them those benefits and why it's happening and, and tailor it to that particular person you're talking to. Mm -hmm. So I like to think of it as the sandwich. You've got the buy-in from the, the folks at the top, you've got your users at the bottom who are driving um, how that system should interact, and then you've got your champions in the middle who might be your admins or the people who are like managing the system who are, are helping um, organically grow it in the middle. So. <laughs> I like that. Um, the one area where you do have some control is especially if you work with contractors um, mm -hmm. that uh, photographers can actually be a pretty prima donna bunch at times you know it's all about the artistic vision uh, that they have and they're there to take pictures and that's it and you'll pay them for that service However, it, it was fun. I went to a, a talk, and it was actually the uh, digital asset manager for the uh, Food Network. And they said it was such a challenge, you know, getting metadata associated with these files when they went in. But yet, because these were not our employees, we couldn't, you know, fire them if they didn't do it or anything like that. He said, but you know what we could do? We could set the standards for what we want to purchase. 
we want photographs with embedded metadata. You can do that in your camera software. You can have the time, the location, you have the ability to enter a text-based description. We can give you a list of tags or keywords, and you must have a minimum of three in all of the assets. When you upload those to us, we will pay you for the ones that meet those standards, and the ones that don't will return to you and you won't get paid for them. And there was a lot of pushback, but somebody who wanted the job said, I'll do it that way. You know, and over time, they've actually gotten to the point where they have a very reliable amount of the metadata already put into the files by the photographer for when it's ingested into the system. So that, that might be an exception to that. Um, and that's not so much a carrot as a stick, but um, you know, there are certainly the potential of things like that. A manager can say, if you don't do this, you're not going to be here in three weeks. Right. So, and, and, and that mm -hmm. kind of uh, system, that kind of check can be built into the solution, right? This damn solution, whether this uh, image is uploaded with three tags or all these things are being followed or not. I mean, something has to check all that. And that is part of the damn solution. Right? If you can come up with very black and white requirements for that, could be three tags, but what if they're useless? You, know, um, you, you may at some point want to audit that, but yes, you can certainly uh, have something go into like a hold queue or an error queue if certain black and white technical things that can be analyzed by a system um, and then a human could come in and go, oh, look, it's that whole photo shoot from Bob. Hey, uh, Bob, your files didn't pass muster. You might want to go through them again and try uploading them again and see if they pass this time. And Bob would be like, yeah, I knew they wouldn't because I didn't want to do that stuff. <laughs> or, oh, I'm sorry, and you'll go back and you'll figure out he just made a mistake and you'll correct it. But then it's on him because that's what he's being paid to provide. It's not here, it may be okay or it may not, but you will have to do it yourself anyway if I screw it up. So that we recommend to our clients that they're doing it within the photography for, with photographers, even vendors, freelance uh, designers, that uh, the system will not accept assets until a certain minute their fields are filled out. So the clients are putting the onus on the vendors, and it's a smart way to do business. We were in a similar kind of uh, situation with our um, with video and our photographers. Uh, when we create material that are outside the company, we're sort of putting in place that, that um, the metadata and the uploads to the system need to be inside the SOW before the work is even completed. So we put that in there and then with the development team we were able to implement uh, mandatory fields of the metadata so it can't be published unless it's you know, uh, part of the mandatory field. So if they at least have the minimum in there, then it can go through. Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be able to upload. And they wouldn't get paid. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, what do you, and that's either uh, individually or collectively, what do you see as some of the uh, challenge areas of digital asset management right now? I think the idea is there are a lot of systems out there that want to leverage your centralized repository of content. Then you're going to have a website, you're going to have a Twitter feed. You're going to have some marketing campaign where you, you, you do this. You're going to have some guy that prints up t-shirts and you're going to want to use your logo or you're going to want to uh, do that. So all of these other systems will have very targeted capabilities. So how do uh, you get your damn systems to easily integrate with those? And a lot of you know people and vendors uh, and, and consultants will say, well, you know what? There's under the hood coding that we could do to provide autom automation and connectivity. But you know what, that ties up people and time and resources, so it's gonna cost money. So the idea is sometime in the future, the idea that you could plug in anything into this system and use that to manage it from one central place so that you've got files on Google Drive and you've got some files on Amazon and you've got some files in Azure. Can you have one system that would manage all of that and function in that same sort of central methodology. And you've got some of those other things that manage your Twitter feed. So every time you tweet or you want to post something to Facebook, it pulls it out, but whatever that tool is that's managing that feed is integrated back into your single source. You know, so I think that's the big challenge to provide the connectivity to all of the tools and all of the new functionality coming out. Some that 
doesn't even exist yet. So cross-platform compatibility? Well, platform is one element of it, but, but also if you think of, yeah, as a task, as a platform, a Twitter platform, a Facebook platform, um, you know, what else is yet to really make a big statement that <clears throat> companies are gonna need to wanna get their content into it. Yeah, I'd add on that. You know, ingestion and the biggest thing uh, that I can see right now that's still problematic is metadata and getting people to accurately put metadata in. You can simplify the process, make it a little easier, because right now you're asking someone to take time out of their day to tag a, a picture or a, a document, and uh, there's just so much medicines to that that it's like almost a constantly, uh, it's a constant battle to get them to uh, adopt and, and, and buy into the program to be able to do that. Like, oh, why would I need to do that? It's, it's taking time out of it. I don't really see the benefit. Um, so it's simplifying the uh, ingestion point, the metadata, and getting that in there. I think that that is you know, still one of the biggest hurdles. And, and Google, AP, Google Vision API is working on that, and they're still trying to automate that. But there's still a process that you need human eyes on. Like you can't auto, you can't auto do it. So. That I still think is a, one of the biggest challenges in there right now. I'll end with, um, <laughs> I think one of the biggest challenges, again, I, I tend to go abstract, um, very high level view. I think as an industry, the industry needs to start talking to its neighbors. And as a system, do you have the right system? Because I think we've gotten to the point where we know we need a system. Is it the right system? And then once you have that system, content doesn't manage itself. So who's gonna put in that metadata? How are we gonna convince them to do it? Who's the right person to do it? How many of those people do we need? Where should they sit? And um, <laughs> then once you have all that together, it's okay, great. Now where does this content need to go? So then comes your integration piece, right? So it's gotta talk to this system, that system, go out to this channel, this person should see it, that person shouldn't. And then um, ultimately, is it still damn 10 years later? Are we now part of SharePoint or something? Or Google, who knows? You know what I mean? Nobody really knows where the industry's going, but um, I think in the end, it, it is about having that base structure around your information and whatever tool you choose to put it into and connect it with will change. But those foundational principles are have always been there for hundreds of years and will still be there, no matter what form it's in.